Good afternoon. Some things in the report just to update you about what's going on currently. Uh, we do try to be involved in as many outreach events as possible so that we get word out to the community about all the programs that are available at the Department on Aging and that we are a resource should people have any questions about what services are available, whether it's provided at the Department on Aging or we connect them with another resource in the community. And especially we're trying to get the word out about our respite services, that these are available for someone who's caring for an older person around the clock or maybe they're an older person caring for an adult child around the clock. Those are for respite services so that the caregiver can leave home for four to six hours once a week or maybe they need overnight care or whatever option works for them. And then the Classic Car Festival, that's another outreach event that we partner with the uh, Jackson County Fair and that went very well uh, this year. Served 420 congregate meals and that's uh, again an opportunity to let people know what the uh, senior nutrition program congregate programs like and uh, we also have our annual senior safe sound and secure seminar and about 50 people attended that event at the human services building speakers from the prosecutor's office United States postal inspector and then uh, someone talking about a power of attorney and how uh, when that might be appropriate then our annual grant program and fiscal assessments, similar to an audit, those were conducted and we were notified that we meet all of the grant standards. Uh, with uh, all of our programs, we have intake information that we enter in a database called Care Advantage and part of this is to upload it to the state of Michigan. It, it's connected with how we receive our grant funding. But with the Congregate Senior Nutrition Program this year, we were able to have the system print off an intake form from last year so that the participants would just need to change information um, so they didn't have to fill out a blank form from scratch. So it's a little more user friendly for people. And then shelf stable meals, we do that each October and we will continue to do it each October but also throughout the year we'll make sure that uh, when people start receiving meals on wheels within two weeks they'll receive two shelf stable meals so in the event for some reason we can't deliver meals maybe there's a major storm and trees are down and we can't get out the older adults will still have meals uh, some food that they could have to eat until we're able to get out and resume providing meals this is the year if you know people who are on Medicare, uh, age 65 and older, they need to relook at their Part D drug plan and review that. And we have staff and volunteers who will walk people through that process, but we need people to have an appointment. They can't just walk in, otherwise they're kind of jumping the line for the other people who are waiting for a return call. But uh, we'll see a lot of appointments uh, through the Part D enrollment. And throughout the year, they keep the MAP coordinator, Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program, or MAP. They keep track of how much money has been saved because a seniors changed their plan, either their supplemental insurance plan or their pr drug Part D drug plan. And over a year, we can save people uh, $1,400,000 because they came in and talked with somebody and made the other choice receive their options we don't sell anything of course we just based on what their situation is give them uh, options that for programs uh, policies that are out there so that's pretty great uh, and I have a moment of excellence I'll read to you but if there are there any questions about the staff report You said this is the year. What's what's changed for the 65 and older? Uh, no, every year. Oh, okay. Maybe I misspoke. Every year, so people 65 and older should at least review their drug plan. And if they want to change supplemental health insurance plans, it needs to happen at this window each year. Open and <laughs> open enrollment. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, something that happened with our meal program, the meal transporter called uh, the meal clerk in the office that uh, senior was having trouble with her words and seemed confused. 
So the meal clerk called the emergency, emergency contact, and the emergency contact went over to the senior's home and took, took them to the hospital and uh, then contacted us the next day and said that the senior had had a stroke. So it was the driver noticing that something wasn't quite, quite right that we were able to connect the senior with, with someone to help them out. So, yep. All right, thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Oops, Richard. It's the Health Department Tobacco Dependence and Dental Clinics Projects Agreement. Good afternoon. The, uh, this particular item is actually a renewal of an existing agreement that we put in place last year with the Michigan Primary Care Association. Uh, we, decided, we looked at this pretty carefully in the health department and decided, well, we knew we were going to have some transition going on with the health education staff in the health department. We, Rhonda Rudolph is retiring the end of December. She wouldn't have been the natural, normal person to do this in the health department, but we decided let's have this uh, continue a contract for another year with MPCA. They've done a good job in connecting with and working with uh, dental clinics in the community. Primarily, it has been a focus with the Center for Family Health and their new dental clinic. So uh, they've offered us the same level of resources, again, for the 18-19, uh, if you will, uh, fiscal year. And um, we've uh, decided we should go ahead and do that. MBCA is willing to contract with us under the same terms and conditions, and there's no changes to the agreement. The work plan is probably updated, but uh, I don't have any concerns about that. I'm pretty sure that uh, our incoming health education person that will replace Rhonda will continue to monitor their progress with this whole effort. So. Uh, addressing systems changes in dental clinics on with relate with respect to tobacco is a good thing to be doing in the community and uh, we'd like to continue to to work with MPCA to that end so I appreciate your consideration of uh, renewing this agreement you looking for a motion and support Any comments or questions for uh, Richard? Does this go to the full board, or is this something that we decide here? It's at a $20,000 level. Uh, I think you can probably decide here. Yep. OK, so it's our decision. So I'll be looking for, we have a motion support uh, for it to be determined here at the Human Services Committee. Uh, those in favor, so going to say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Thank you very much. Thank you. On the number E, Health Department, monthly report. We had a lot of stuff going on in October, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on a few highlights. Um, I'm working uh, closely now with uh, Richard Martin Jack, our HR director, on uh, the recruitment strategy for me. I will be retiring next June, if you will, so we've already initiated the process. I have a couple of uh, recruitment updates there. Uh, we've met with uh, representatives of Allegiance Health, Dr. Ray King. Uh, and I met uh, uh, in that first update there to review content of the health officer job description and the health officer services agreement with Henry Ford Legion's Health. We did some minor changes to each of those. Um, part of it, I think, is probably reflected, well, maybe not in update number three, but the job description has been updated. Richard has prepared that for us, and basically he and I are going to meet this week or next week, if you will, to uh, do some real recruitment strategy work, if you will, uh, to make sure we get the right person in place here in Jackson County uh, to replace me. We do plan to have some overlap because there's a lot of places and things that I need to help a new health officer get familiar with. I didn't have that opportunity when I came, but I had a lot of experience in this kind of work in this position, so I think I was a much easier transition. But the next person may not have that, so I want to help them out as much as I can. Um, we had uh, we started our expanded administrative team and executive team meetings at the health department. So our administrative team used to be just myself and three division directors and our administrative assistant. We've expanded that administrative team now to include eight coordinators within the health department because we want to help them engage with us more in the decision making processes. It's our part of our high performance organization work that we're doing at the health department. So we had our first meeting on October 25th. It went well. And I've kind of described it for you, if you will, what the intent is uh, uh, as far as providing uh, input for the JCHD leaders in that. 
then we have a second executive team member, which is those same five people I just mentioned a minute ago. We meet for an additional two hours on other matters that we felt needed to be held at that level versus at the admin team level. Um, perhaps you've heard something about the Jackson Collaborative Network Retreat that took place on October 23rd. I attended along with a couple of other people from the health department. I did include in your packet um, some of the, the data and the documents that we reviewed um, at that meeting. And I think that the uh, backbone staff of the Jackson, um, of the, the Collaborative Network did a really good job in pulling together a lot of different information. The anatomy of a family, the anatomy of a child, the anatomy of a community, uh, and then the last one that we looked at was the anatomy of a person. Um, it's kind of like the takeaways that people kind of came away with on that particular day was people are, were struggling to find bright spots, if you will, among all this data. There are some in here, but there were less of those and there were other issues about health and social service concerns uh, and needs, if you will, in the community. A lot of poverty exists in our community. I don't think anybody here doesn't know that, but it's sometimes just striking to see the numbers kind of jump out at you. Um, when we have um, uh, among youth living in single female households, 60% live in poverty, that's a huge concern. And I think that's what all the collaborative networks in the community are trying to do is to address things like that. If we could eliminate poverty, we could eliminate an awful lot of other health and social welfare issues if we can get there. So that's what we're trying to do. I'm happy to answer any question on any of those that you might have. Um, we continue to test the different systems we have access to for call down emergency preparedness and response activity purposes, if you will. We had one in September. We had a quarterly call down drill using the Michigan Health Alert Network. Uh, the unfortunate part of the Health Alert Network is not designed specifically for that purpose, so it didn't work well, but at least we tested it and we found out that, that it didn't work really well. There are other things that we can use and we have used. Code Red has been more effective than the Health Alert Network. So uh, based on the results that we got in September, we would not uh, be trying to use that system unless they were able to make some adjustments to it. But we have lots of other ways of getting a hold of people. Good news, um, the uh, state legislature and the governor did pass a four and a half million dollar increase in funding for mandated services uh, to health departments and the funds are distributed using a local funding formula. Um, you can see in the table that I have on page two of my report what the amount, amended amounts were, the increases were if you will. Overall it's about a $67,000 increase for us at the health department and it's basically about 13% in the mandated program funding. So we're pleased to take that. It's a relatively small amount, but we're happy to get whatever we can to continue to uh, maintain those services. Um, <clears throat> our Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative is sponsoring Cole Williams, a motivational speaker on fatherhood and familyhood on November 11th. So if you know someone in your family or friends or anybody that you think might benefit from listening to, to Cole, we encourage you to refer them. I did attach uh, that particular um, flyer to my report as well. WIC program, we uh, received notice that our FY 2019, 2019 nutrition services plan for the WIC program has been approved and we were um, recognized for our ability to decrease the incidence of low hemoglobin levels uh, among children from 18.5 to 14.5 percent. So that's a great outcome. And we'll continue that with postpartum women. And we've also been able to uh, increase our closeout participation rate to base caseload by 4.21% since March. So that's, that's good as well. Um, we work with other organizations in the community. And one of the things that uh, was brought to our attention, probably by uh, maybe moms coming through the WIC program or the immunization clinic, boy, it sure be nice if you had something for the kids to read while they were here. And so we worked with the Great Star Collaborative. They had some money available to help us organize a little free library right there in the Human Services Building ground floor lobby. And if you're in the building, stop by, take a look. Donations of books are always accepted. So it was very, very, very well accepted. The hepatitis A outbreak I, is kind of lengthy. 
I'm sorry. Uh, Richard, if, if we reached out to the district library because they have a surplus of books and asked oh. them to possible restock on a regular basis? I will certainly make a note of that. Thank you. Um, there's quite a bit of information in my report on the hepatitis A outbreak update. I don't need to read this for you guys. I think you all know what's kind of been going on historically with the people who have been more at risk for it. Uh, perhaps on the third page, if you will, or fourth page, there's an epidemic curve, if you will, of what this whole outbreak has looked like since its beginning back in 2016. And you can see that uh, we were in the peak of things in the summer of 2017. It's kind of come down quite a bit, but there are still some active transmission going on. We could, you can see from kind of June forward uh, in this particular calendar year, we had some more cases occur. Uh, my copy is not in red, so I can't tell exactly which particular weeks there were involved, but they're the same outbreak strain that continues to be transmitted. So the bottom line for us is we need to keep doing what we're doing with hepatitis A outreach and vaccination. Um, and we'll try to do that within our existing resources. We hear that there has been a, um, I'm not sure what they're calling at the state level, a set aside or uh, a, a uh, an amount of money that's earmarked for this to continue in 2018 going forward, but it's not yet in our budget, but we're hoping it will. Um, we are working hard. I know uh, Commissioner Mahoney is not here this afternoon, but he uh, did ask us at some point in time to do a presentation on sexually transmitted infection in the community. We're getting close to being ready to do that with you, and I hope to have it done for the, the December meeting um, of, the, of, the, of the Human Services Committee. Um, we have been working with a group in the community called Jackson Harm Reduction. Yes. Well, whenever he asks us to do a presentation, is it the whole board or is it this committee? I'm not sure which one. Okay. Because we usually come here, but I can go wherever you want. Study session is fine, too. Uh, Jackson Harm Reduction Letter of Support. We've been working with Jackson Harm Reduction in the community for some time now. This group is interested in providing a number of harm reduction services, and they'd like to start with doing that within the city of Jackson. And the services specifically seek to address the opioid and heroin use problem in our community. Um, it can include testing for HIV and hepatitis C, sexually transmitted diseases, vaccinations, overdose prevention education, referral for treatment, if you will, uh, medical care, social services referrals, safe disposal of used injection materials, naloxone distribution, and potentially um, the distribution of sterile syringes and needles. And uh, uh, it's a, I think it's been well received in communities where this has already been done, such as Grand Rapids. There are a couple locations now in northern Michigan. One's in Chippewa County. One is in District Health Department Number 2, kind of up in the Upper Thumb area. They both have programs now in place. And usually, historically, what we see is a significant reduction in HIV transmission significant reduction in hepatitis C, new infections, and also more people getting into treatment where we want them to go in the first place. So that's really the major emphasis is not so much, yes, come here, get sterile syringes and needles so that you don't infect yourself and don't infect other people. It's really about getting them into treatment, and that's what we're focused on. Um, the rabies web pages, one of our community members brought to our attention that there wasn't enough information. Richard, Sorry. Richard yeah. can I go back to the harm uh, bullet point? Sure. <clears throat> I'm having a hard time understanding when we have an opioid epidemic why we want, and I appreciate the disease protection of HIV and Hep C, but why do we want to blindly distribute needles without an education and further in the up above in the agenda, we talked about uh, tobacco education to people during dental. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have, when you pick up your needle, do you have to sit through an orientation on why heroin is bad with for you, why injection is bad for you? Yes. And do we also go over proper disposal of the needle and syringes, or do they just 
can they just dump them on the street as like the problem they're having right now in Lansing? No, the way that this program is designed to work, if you're coming to a harm reduction center, you're bringing what you already have and what you've been using for disposal. They don't get issued anything without education. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so it's not like we're handing alcoholic shot glasses. No. They're going to end up with a good, uh, a good education of why opioid abuse is is bad for you and, and yes. we should get you lined up into a treatment program and everything along those lines also, correct? That's, that's the emphasis. I understand that's the emphasis, but if I walk in the door as a current user, hmm? do I meet with a social worker and you go over that with me? Or do I just sign a paper and turn in my old stuff and get new? Every visit to a center like this involves an interaction with a, a staff member, a peer mentor, they may be a social worker, they may be someone who's already gone through the addiction recovery process, but every time that they, they come to a center for these kinds of things, they do get education and they're sat down to find out how are they doing? Are you potentially ready now to get into treatment? Those are the kinds of questions that they will engage okay, with. So there, there is, there is some one-on-one -on -one yes. interaction. It's, it's, not just just not a it's not just a drive through window. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. And the city's going to have these locations? Well, at this point in time, the city has not um, taken the action to approve a location. That might happen in November because there are some things that the city needs to do to kind of authorize it so that the drug paraphernalia sections of the public health code can be exempted. They can do that by passing a resolution or amending their existing ordinance for drug paraphernalia in the city. And people who would come to a center like this would get a card that would identify them as using the center services. And that's kind of their proof that I'm, I'm, yeah, I've got a problem. I'm recognizing I have a problem with drug abuse. And I'm using heroin or I'm using opioids and I'm injecting. But at the same time, we're asking our community law enforcement partners not to arrest people because they may be in possession of drug paraphernalia because they have the card and that we're trying to get them into treatment. Okay, I'm still very apprehensive about all this. I understand. And, and my concern is like how I said, stated at the beginning, <clears throat> you know, we don't give shot glasses to alcoholics. Mm -hmm. I think we're giving them the delivery system to continue poisoning themselves. And I, I just have a real concern about it. Well, and, I, I, and, and I've been reading a lot about states like Oregon, Washington, California, and places that are doing this. Mm -hmm. And USC is saying that they really have no measurable results that show true reduction uh, in heroin use. Mm -hmm. um, and that there is a concern, uh, in my mind, that we're just, all we're doing is, is enabling the user mm -hmm. through um, a behavior of uh, passive knowledge. You know, oh, you're a bad person, and you should stop doing that. Here's your needle. Mm -hmm. Go away. That, that's that's my big concerns with this. Is that, is that I want to make sure that we're really attempting to co to curtail this problem. Well, that is the ultimate objective: is to curtail the I, problem, I reduce the overdose, and reduce the deaths. These programs have been shown to be effective in doing that, and I I have a lot more information I can share if, when, and where you'd like us to do that. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. Thank you for answering my questions. Yep. Richard. Yes, sir. Just carry on from that. You mentioned measurable data. So do you, do you have something set up where we're going to actually be able to measure whether or not uh, this, uh, this is actually going to be working? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, the metrics that we've already learned about are easy to... We've already, we've already got quite a bit of the data to help us understand whether or not it'd be effective. So you may remember the drug-related report that was presented earlier this year or late last year before the last drug summit. All that data is, is available to us, and some of it is related to being able to put these kinds of services in place. So in terms of the overdose, over, number of overdoses that are going to EDs and the number of over, overdose deaths, those are two pieces we can easily monitor. But there's a lot of other data that's more process-oriented that, that hopefully will be available to us, too. The group knows what they need to collect information on. Just to be clear, this isn't a, um, a service that is being run at all by the county health department. 
this is going to be a nonprofit organization in the community. Yep. Okay. Um, the rabies webpage changes uh, I was talking about a minute ago. We received we received some feedback from a community member who said, "Gee, I encountered a bat in my house. I wasn't really sure what to do with it. I'm not sure how to capture it. I'm not sure what I should be doing for my family." And she went to the health department website and she didn't find what she needed. Now it's there. So that's a good example of us taking feedback from the community when we get it and improving the service that we're providing. And she was very happy with what we put together now and is present at the, at the health department website. It's basically, here's what to do to protect your family. Here's what you should do with the bat if you can capture it and how to do that carefully and safely. And then we can get it tested which is always the best way to approach it. Otherwise, we can end up in some situations, and we have ended up in situations where a bat is in a child's bedroom. Uh, it's flying around. It's landing here. It's landing there. We don't know for sure whether the child has been scratched or bitten. So the default is we start the child on vaccination. If we don't have to start them on vaccination because we have the bat, we can test it. Great. Most of the time they come out negative, but bats are the number one positive tested rabies animal in our community. We get some positive ones every year. Uh, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, uh, we did an in-service with schools. You may have uh, heard some concerns expressed out there uh, anecdotally or in other ways that uh, indicated that uh, immunization information that parents share with schools when they're registering their children can't be shared with health departments under FERPA. So we had to have an in-service to help the schools understand, yes, that's actually true, but here's a way for parents to opt in or opt out of sharing information with local health departments. And there still is a way for schools to make us, uh, make it possible for a school, a, a health department member to have access to that information on a short-term basis in order to resolve a problem. So that's what the in-service was about. We had two of them on the same day on October 18th, and it went pretty well. Um, MDHHS is offering us some money again to restart the uh, mosquito surveillance program, if you will. This time it might include ticks as well. Uh, I think it's really important for us to continue to collect and trap mosquitoes and have them tested and identified because as our climate seems to be continually warming up, vectors of diseases south of the border are going to gradually move north. And if they move north, they can be capable of transmitting diseases, and uh, we want to be prepared and know that they're here. So we're going to apply, we're going to apply for that funding. It's up to $8,000 that, that we can obtain. So that's pretty much my monthly report. Happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Any further questions for Richard? All right, thank you for the report. We're on to number F now, the Health Department 2018-19 contract with the MDEQ. This is the standard kind of language agreement contract that we have with the EQ for a number of services that we normally provide uh, on, a, on a continuous ongoing basis. This funds the non-community type two public drinking water supply program uh, drinking water long-term monitoring if there are places to monitor here in the community, public swimming pools, septage, waste, and campground inspection programs. Um, I think the bottom line here in terms of the finance side, we have a small increase in this contract, about almost $4,000 from the 2017-18 amount. And um, uh, I kind of tried to identify uh, where the increase is occurring. Um, this agreement was effective October 1st, and as we have done in previous years, we always know that the contract is coming, the amount may change slightly, but we continue to provide services necessarily without having a signed contract on October 1st. So we'd like to uh, continue this contract agreement with the EQ and would ask for your support. Our, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, motion? Support. Support. Uh, we're at $53,279 in this contract, then? I believe that's about correct. So we yes, can keep that is. committee as well, right, Mr. Administrator? Yes. Okay, so this will stay here at the committee. All those in favor, signal saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 
All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Richard. We're down to Administrator, Controller, Veterinarian, Animal Shelter uh, request. This request was um, is a combination. What happened is shortly after we approved um, last month's part-time veterinarian um, to be added as a result of the millage, our existing veterinarian has submitted her resignation. Um, her last day with Jackson County will be December 15th. And so we have had the position posted for approximately three weeks to no avail. Um, we don't currently have any applicants. So the request is to have some flexibility since we um, had two part-time positions. If we do find somebody that is interested in a full-time capacity, um, we would like the flexibility to do that. So we're going to try and fill the two part-time positions, um, but we have not had any applicants. So if we do have anybody come forward, we would like the ability to make it a full-time position if that person wishes. So we're just looking for a little flexibility to increase the odds of finding a person to fill the position. And Lydia is here as well um, to answer any, any specific questions about the market. We did post it on three job-specific um, websites as well as Indeed. And um, Lydia has checked our pay grade and... Um, qualifications and she has indicated that they are accurate um, and that we've got a good pay grade that we're advertising so we're right there in the market as far as market rate um, so we've done what we can think of and Lydia can answer any other specific questions if you have any comments or questions Okay, this will go to the full board, and this is, uh, again, flexibility for the administration to negotiate, uh, if necessary, for full time. Uh, all, all those in favor, well, motion and support, excuse me. Support. Yeah, motion and support. All those in favor, so you say an aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're down to the claims of the full board. All those in favor, I'm going to say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other minutes? We have none. And the December reporting is uh, Department of Aging, Health Department, LifeWage, DHHS, and Medical Care Facility. Back to public comment. Public comment? Public comment. All right. Hearing none. Committee members, commissioner comments, anybody want to comment? Okay. It is. 1234 and we are adjourned at the call of the chair.